Hello and welcome to Stupid Ancient History with Midgley and Taylor and our expert, non-expert and special guest James is Science Tool Boy. Hello. So as always we're wearing togas, we're actually in strawberry laces today which is a nice change um, and we're going to look at Udja Horosnet. Uh, what is an Udja Horosnet? <laughs> well Udja Horosnet was actually quite a high-ranking Egyptian official who was alive during the reign of Cambyses. That was a bloke. It was a bloke. Oh, right. <laughs> um, but he's not anymore. But it seems he had a somewhat important role within Cambyses' government in Egypt and definitely benefited from the presence of the Persians. So it's quite likely that he's a bit of an ally to Cambyses then? Yeah? Um, although he's no longer around, obviously, to tell us what he thought. I mean, it would be quite impressive if he was. Or worrying. Um, or worrying, yeah. But we do have um, a few <coughs> new statue which recounts his various achievements. And um, I'm assuming that this is in the British Museum, Mr. Mitchell. No, Vatican this time. Oh, oh fancy. There you go, mm. Mm. When about in um, Cambyses' rule was he about? Was it... The, the promising start <laughs> or the mental end? He doesn't really specify. Okay. Uh, so what does this thing say? Uh, so importantly for us, Udja Horosnet gives a very different account to the kind of more traditional Greek sources. So for a start, it refers to Cambyses as the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, which is part of the traditional title of a pharaoh, which suggests that at least from this guy's point of view, Cambyses was not an occupying tyrant. So it also gives details of Cambyses visiting temples in Sais and being respectful, bowing his head, etc. And actually restoring and reinforcing the worship of Egyptian gods. Um, so it's almost like the portrayals of Cyrus in Babylon, which are a far cry from kind of the madman that has been depicted in the right, he, he murdered that bull, so he wasn't that respectful yeah. to their gods, was no. he? No, so this is like the it's the, the opposite kind of view that we're getting about him from looking at this source. Okay. So this is a different version of the same kind of events. Yeah, so I know you said it was ju it's just the title they give, but the upper and lower Nile bit. Was yeah. it the lower Nile where he went and ate all his horses and stuff? No, it's the, that was the upper Nile. That, so we didn't even make it that far. <laughs> well, the, the the lower Nile is the bit nearest the sea. <laughs> ah, the upper right, Nile okay. is higher up. And yeah, it's part of the title a pharaoh would have. It's normally kind of king of upper and lower Egypt, uh, son of the sun god, the living Horus. Right, I'm thinking of it map-wise, like upper is north. Okay, no, no, they enough. didn't like that. <laughs> but even though it is wildly different to Herodotus, we do need to point some other things out that Udja Horosnet is not the only source that gives this completely different perspective on Cambyses. There is actually talking about the stabby stabby bull story. <laughs> <laughs> there is, that's how it's officially recorded. Um, there is an inscription for the Apis bull in Memphis, um, which we'll put on the screen, uh, that also contradicts the standard Herodotus account. What does that say that he gave it a hook instead of stabbing <laughs> it in the leg? Well, not quite. But. <laughs> so the inscription is actually dated to 524 BC, and it says that Cambyses took charge of the ceremonies associated with the Apis bull, and rather than kind of wildly stabbing it in some kind of rage, he actually conducted these properly. So okay. he didn't kill it, he actually showed it the respect and reverence which he should have been shown. Um, so it's suggesting, as Ujjahara's net does, that Cambyses was actually regarded more like Cyrus. Okay. Do we know who wrote this source in Memphis? Because the Ujjahara's net was written by a friend of his. Um, it was an official inscription, so it will have been carved by... Like, state-issued, almost. State-issued, so from the time of Cambyses. So okay. there, there's obviously issues with it. Uh, so why is this important? Why do we care about it? Uh, so the important point with Udja Horosnet and this inscription that says is that it does give us this contradictory view of Cambyses. It's particularly useful if you're asked to make a judgment on the character of Persian kings. So if we're thinking about uh, were the Persian kings good, kind, tolerant, you know, completely, mental. hat stand, mental, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mitchell's words, not mine. So it, you can use it for that because obviously it means that you've got two sides to the story. Yeah, you've got a yeah. counter argument that you can use. So 
if you didn't have that, obviously it would just be completely one-sided, so you wouldn't have any balance. So is this, this is why like, it's important. Is this just like one of the few sources you have other than Herodotus? Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, if, you, if you're asked to make, write a response about the character of Cambyses, it's going to be very difficult to come up with that kind of on one hand however mm. but with these extra sources it turns out you actually can yeah and even though in the periods that we study you don't have to explicitly evaluate sources you can still use it if kind of the issue is raised as long as it's supporting your argument okay so even though you might not necessarily get a question that's just about the sources you might want to put it in there as an extension of a point that you're making when you're developing that point to try and get more marks But the other th issue we need to think about is um, how we put these two wildly different views of Cambyses together. So the issue of reliability is clear. Um, we know Herodotus relied heavily on the Egyptian priesthood in his research and they clearly had an axe to grind with Cambyses. It's probably likely that they were still angry that Cambyses made temples pay tax, so they lost a lot of money. Ah, uh, okay. But it also seems that there were Egyptians, such as Ujjaharithnet, who had a more favourable view of the Persians. Well, he, he did work for them. Well, yeah. And the inscription at Memphis was done during Persian rule. So, obviously, if you've got the Persians that are in control, you're probably more likely to write something positive. Because if you don't, we all know what the Persians can do to you. Well, we all know what Cambyses would do to you. Exactly. Yeah. So the truth really is probably somewhere in between the two, yeah. which M is pretty much what we'd say about any period within ancient history. It's always you get you normally get two extremes, and yeah. really you've got to kind of go for the middle ground. Yeah, uh, kind of looking at the good side. Do you know what what did what could they have brought to Egypt? Was it like stability? Did they bring wealth? Anything like that? Well, Egypt was wealthy already. Stability, um, a bit more structure by the time of the Persian rule the Egyptian pharaoh system was crumbling. So, yeah, bit of bit of stability, wider trade network, protection against their enemies. Mm -hmm. There will have been some benefits. So, yeah, it wasn't all bad. No. So there you have it, our quick guide to who or what is Ujjahora's net. Thank you for listening. We hope this has been useful. Leave us a comment below, and until next time, goodbye. Bye. Bye.